your pastor is home, barely. <laughs> they had a uh, long trip back from Jordan, I guess they left from, and uh, he said it was 40 hours of traveling. And uh, if you haven't been up traveling for 40 hours, you really don't understand <laughs> what it does to your body and to your brain. And uh, uh, he, he fully intended to tough it out and come tonight. He said, I've got to be back in the pulpit. Uh, my, my people are, you know, uh, anxious to have their pastor back. So you can all say, you know, we didn't miss you at all. No, don't say that. So it was his desire and intention to be here tonight, uh, but he didn't quite make it. So I am just delighted that I can be here. And so uh, we're going to take a little foray into the Word of God tonight and see what the Lord has for us. As we come to our study of the Word of God, we need to make sure that we are prepared for the study of God's Word. We need to be sure that there is nothing to hinder the Holy Spirit from being the teacher tonight. If there's sin in your life between you and the Lord, you need to confess that to the Father so that you might be forgiven and cleansed so that the Holy Spirit has the freedom to open to us the spiritual truth of God's Word. So uh, let's start with prayer, shall we? We are grateful, Heavenly Father, that you have revealed to us everything that we need to understand about you and your plan. I thank you that we have this revelation in writing. We know that uh, because it's in writing, it hasn't changed, it hasn't been modified, and uh, we can have absolute confidence that your word is true, it's sure. I thank you also that we have the privilege of having a copy each one of us in his own language, so that we can read it, we can study it, we can come to know about your provision, your promises, the greatness of your grace to us. I pray tonight that as we open your word together that the Holy Spirit will open our hearts to truth and we might be better equipped, better prepared to serve you, fulfill the purpose for which you've left us alive in this life. And I would ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews is an amazing document. It is so well crafted. And I think that oftentimes when we read the Bible, we focus in on a verse or a short passage. And oftentimes we lose sight of the whole picture because we're zeroing in on small portions of it. But this is just a, a marvelous document, the way that it was put together. We don't know who wrote it, many ideas about that. But what the writer of Hebrews is doing is trying to show that Jesus is superior to anything or anyone that you might want to compare him to. Jesus is greater. He is better. He is superior. And so what he does is to present great theological truth. But then people are beginning to drift away from their adoration, their worship, their service of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're going in the opposite direction. And so the writer then will give a warning about the dangers of ignoring scriptural truth. And then, after the warning, he comes back and he gives another slug of theology, and then he puts in another warning, and then we get more doctrine and another warning. So there are five great warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Now, each of these deals with attitude toward the Word of God. 
In chapter 2, we have the warning about drifting away from the things that we have been taught. It's not that it's negative to doctrine. It's not a rejection of the Word of God. It's this idea that you just sort of drift away from it. It, It's not so important. I'm not really motivated to read my Bible. I'm not so motivated to study the Word of God. And it's not that I, I don't like it or don't want it. It's just we get distracted and we just drift away. And the picture is you've got a boat that's tied up alongside the river and the rope comes loose. And the boat just slowly drifts away. And he writes a warning about that in chapter 2. In chapter 3, we have another warning where we have people who begin to doubt the Word of God. They don't believe the Word of God. God has made many promises, and we have seen how God has worked in the past, and yet when we are faced with a critical situation, we don't believe the Word. Has God really said? Well, we just don't believe that God is going to take care of us. And so we begin to worry. We have doubts. And when we begin to lack faith in the Word of God in our daily lives, the result is disobedience. So we go from unbelief to disobedience. And the writer in chapter 3 says it's possible... If you don't mix the Word of God with faith, then you're going to wander in a spiritual desert and die under a curse. Just like the children of Israel out in the desert, God provided all their needs. He fed them miraculously every day. He protected them from enemy attack. He provided all of their clothing, everything they needed. But they were miserable, and they died under a curse from God. The writer of Hebrews says, you need to be careful because the same thing could happen to you. When we get to chapter 5, we have another warning, and he says, by this time in your spiritual life, you should be able to communicate spiritual truth to others. You should be able to teach. Not that you have necessarily a spiritual gift for teaching, but you should be able to tell others what you believe. You should be able to tell others what is in the Word of God. He said, but you need someone to teach you again, even very basic doctrines. And so he says, what we need to do is to go on to maturity. We need to grow up in the spiritual life, which means we have to keep on growing. And then he gives the warning. If you don't want to grow up, it may be that God will not allow you to grow up. And you're going to remain a spiritual idiot the rest of your life. Literally. You don't want to grow. You don't want to take in the Word. Oh, I had a man here in Houston a couple of years ago. I was talking to him, and he'd gotten away from church. He wasn't going to Bible class anymore, even though he grew up in a doctrinal teaching church. Been there for years, but now he's drifted away from that. And uh, I was talking to him, what are you doing? He said, Jim, I know enough doctrine. What an arrogant statement that is. The writer of Hebrews says, let's go on to maturity, and we will do this if God permits. It may be that God will not permit it. Really? Yeah, you don't want to grow up? God says, fine. I won't let you grow up. And you know, you can, you can see somebody, they're 40 years old, but they have a mind of a five-year-old. That's not very attractive. We have the same thing in the spiritual life. People have been saved for years and years. They're still spiritual babies. So the warning is given, don't neglect the Word of God. Keep on taking it in. You need to be taking in not only milk, you need to be taking in solid food so that you can grow. When we get to chapter 10, we have another warning. Now things are getting more serious. Not only are people not believing and not obeying the Word of God, now people begin to 
actually despise their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. They become ashamed of their testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want to be associated with Christianity any longer for whatever reason. In the book of Hebrews, it's because they started getting persecution. I don't, I don't want anyone to know I'm a Christian. But they also begin to repudiate even their testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer of Hebrews says, I want to tell you something. Under the law of Moses, people who committed certain sins died without mercy. There were some sins under the law. If you committed those sins, there was no sacrifice that you could bring for forgiveness. No sacrifice. What are you going to do in that case? Well, the law said you take them out and kill them. Take them out and stone them. They died without mercy. He says there is something worse. You might have to face something worse than dying without mercy. And I often ask, what could be worse than dying without mercy? Do you know what it is? It's to live without mercy. Ooh, stop and think about that. You want to live without God's mercy? That's frightening. But he said, if you want to despise your Christian testimony and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can expect severe discipline. Now, beginning in Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 19, we, we have another section in uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, and then when we get into chapter 11, you're all familiar with that, the uh, hall of faith or the hall of fame, as some people call it. And in this chapter, chapter 11, you have people who manifested faith in God and in the Word of God, heroes from the Old Testament. Now here we are not talking about faith for salvation. Some preachers today want to say, well, this demonstrates their salvation. This is not about saving faith, but this is talking about salvation or uh, faith after salvation. So we're saved by faith. That's a moment of time, but we have to walk by faith. We have to live by faith day after day. Now we need to have a faith in the Word of God, and this is something that needs to grow. It needs to be developed so we can become stronger in our faith. And so what we see in chapter 11 are people who at some point in their life, at least once, exercised faith in God. And the point that he's trying to make here is that these people faced pressure situations. They faced difficulties. They had tremendous problems or challenges to their faith, and they said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. All right, now we come to Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 1, he says, therefore. Now, when you find the word therefore, you need to understand it is always making reference to previously presented information. What has he said before? Well, he's been building up to this. And so he's been talking about the fact that if you reject your testimony, repudiate the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have uh, serious discipline from God. He gives the examples of people who did not give up in the face of great adversity or great challenges to their faith. And now he says, therefore, based upon what we have just seen, we're going to draw some conclusions. Now he has said, we have been given better promises than they had in the Old Testament. We in the body of Christ, we have greater spiritual resources. We have better promises. We have so much better than they ever had in the Old Testament. And now he's going to make a conclusion about what he has been teaching. And he is going to say, we must be loyal 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, therefore, we also. Now, we, he means as well as all of those who were mentioned uh, at the end of uh, chapter 11, verse 39. We said, all these having obtained good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. Now, we have better promises. Now, he says, we also. We have something better that has been provided for us. He says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Literally says we have lying around us this cloud of witnesses. Now the word cloud here, it's an interesting word. Uh, There were several different Greek words for clouds, and this one means a vast array of clouds. It's not some single little cloud uh, floating across the sky, but uh, it means a vast mass of clouds. And the idea is that all around us, we have witnesses. Now, the word for witness here, don't get confused. This is not a word for a spectator. They have a word for spectator. I mean, you sit up in the stands and you can watch the race that's being run in the hippodrome or the amphitheater. You can sit up there and be a spectator. This is not the word for being a spectator. The witness here is somebody who is giving testimony, somebody who is actually doing the word of God, somebody who is believing God, applying the doctrine to their experience, and they are giving testimony to it. They are giving expression to their faith. So they are witnesses in that sense. They're not witnesses in the sense they're watching something, but in the sense that they are telling something. They are exhibiting something in their spiritual life. So here they are called a cloud of witnesses here. Um, So they testify of their own experience. And that was chapter 11. We can read about their experience as they face difficulty, as they had pressure, as they have challenges to their faith. They gave testimony uh, as to how God kept his promises. God is always faithful to his word. And so we can read that chapter and it can strengthen our faith. But the writer of Hebrews is also saying, and we have better promises. Now, if we have better promises than they had in the Old Testament, and they exhibited their faith, they gave testimony, how much more should we do in our lives because we have greater spiritual resources and we have better promises? Now, he says, since this is true, that we have these who are giving testimony, he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Lay aside, word for taking off clothing, laying it aside, and he's going to use a metaphor here of someone who is going to run a race. It used to be they would call the runners in a race the thin clads. Uh, I can remember the The first time I saw that expression, a thin clad, what in the world does that word mean? And then I realized, of course, well, the runners take off all possible clothing because it weights you down. So he's saying, let us lay aside every weight, every encumbrance. Now, he's going to apply this to our spiritual life. What is it that keeps you from exercising your faith, fear, doubt? You're worried about things, worried about things you can't change. You worry about tomorrow. Or perhaps your weight is laziness. That weights down a lot of Christians. Just too lazy. Oh, I don't have time to get up and pray. I don't have time to get up and read my Bible. I don't have time to go out and talk to others about Jesus. I don't have time. I'm lazy. That's, that's a, a hindrance. There are other people who are fearful, afraid somebody might laugh at me, afraid somebody might think that I'm a fanatic, afraid somebody might think that I'm a Jehovah Witness. 
I was in his church. They had asked me to come and teach principles of evangelism, so I, I was teaching there, and I said, you need to go out and talk to people. They said, but they'll think we're Mormons. I said, what do you care? Why do you care what they think? We're here to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes we have a weight. Maybe it's just pride. Why do I care what other people think? Well, because I'm proud. <laughs> I don't want them to think that I'm a fanatic. And oftentimes we're just afraid to tell other people that we are Christians. But the idea here is you're going to run a race and you don't want things that are going to slow you down, get in your way. He talks next about the sin which so easily besets us. Um, this is a, a difficult word to translate. Uh, probably a dozen different ways that uh, I've seen it translated. Uh, literally translated, it means to place something around well. It doesn't make any sense to us to uh, translate this literally, but it means to place around or to stand around, and it says there is a sin standing around us. Uh, in this case, uh, in Hebrews, the uh, sin was apostasy from Christ. In our case, it may be something else. There's, there's something that is around us, perhaps a life-dominating sin, something that we just can't seem to have the victory over, and yet we can. We're told that we can have victory over the sin nature. We can have victory over any sin no matter what the challenge, and he's saying here, we need to lay it aside. Whatever that is, sin is that is surrounding us, the easily encompassing or surrounding sin, um, it might be a picture of here you are, you're by your campfire, and you look out and you begin to see these eyes all around the campfire wild beasts ready to pounce on you. Well, that's the idea uh, here. It would be like Genesis uh, chapter 4 where the Lord said to Cain, sin is crouching, ready to pounce on you, but you must overcome it. Uh, so here we have a sin that easily or surrounds us, and we need to lay it aside. It is possible. Whatever it is that's keeping you from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. And so once we set aside the weight and the surrounding sin, that's not enough. Too often we think, well, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. Well, yeah, that's negative. What are you doing? You know, we're glad if you're not doing these bad things, but that's not enough to say, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. No, now he says we must run. Let us run. Let us keep on running the race. And we have to do this with patience. Not with impatience, not with doubt, not with despair, but with endurance. And the word for patience, it's a word that means that you can stand up under pressure. When pressure is put upon you, you don't buckle. You endure the pressure. Now, we are in a race. You don't have a choice about that. We're all in a race. But you do have a choice about how you will run. And you can run to win. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 and following, following the, the Apostle Paul says, we need to run the race in such a way as to win the prize. Too often people are in the race and they say, well, I don't really care if I win the prize. I'm, I'm not in it for the reward. 
Well, it sounds, oh, I don't know, very humble, doesn't it? Oh, I'm not interested in rewards. Well, you need to be. You ought to want to get the gold medal. That ought to be a desire. The Bible says, run in such a way as to win the prize. Why? Just imagine you're going to run in the Olympic Games. And your father is up in the stands. And the father says, oh, look, look, that's my child down there. Going to run in the Olympic Games. I'm so proud of my child. Made it all the way to the Olympics. Here we are. And so you get ready to run the race. The runners all crouch down. The gun goes off. Everybody starts to sprint except you. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll jog a little bit. I don't care if I win the gold. Really? And what would your father think? Would your father be proud? Oh, that's my child. Look at my child down there walking toward the finish line. Would he be proud? No. Why do we want to win the race? Because it will please the Father. That's why. Yes, I can get the reward. But ultimately, it's the Father who's going to be glorified because He's the one that provides everything necessary for me to be able to win that race. Now, the writer here says we need to keep on running and we need to do it with endurance. There are times when you want to quit Spiritual life is hard, no question about it, but it's not as hard as the alternative. The way of the transgressor is hard. Yeah, the spiritual life is hard, but you want to turn away from God, you want to turn away from the spiritual life, then you're going to find out what hard really is. So let us keep on running with endurance in spite of the pressures. We run the race. Now, the word race... It's the Greek word agon, from which we get agony. And it means a competition, a contest. In this particular instance, we know that it's a race because he said, let's run. And so it's translated here, race. It's the race of life. It's the course of your life. And it means that there must be exertion and self-denial in the face of conflict. So we have a race and we are in it now. He says we have a race that is set before us. The word set before means to be out in front, something that's prospective, something that's in the future, a proposed goal. Something that's set before you is something to move toward, something to strive for. Now, we have a race that has been set out in front of us. That's God's business. Now, we are not in competition one with the other, but we all have a race to run. And God is the one who has determined the course of your life. He has set it out there for you. The Bible says that God has fashioned your days even before you were born. God has a plan for you. Now, you can choose to go with the plan, or you can choose to ignore it. That's your choice. If you choose not to uh, follow the course that God has set out for your life, then you're going to waste your life. And you're never going to find true significance in life. You'll never find true peace and joy. So we need to run with endurance the race that has been set before us. Run it, don't run it. It's your choice. Now in verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now he says, looking unto Jesus. The word looking actually means to look away. Now he's not saying look away from Jesus. He's saying let's look away from all of the 
things that would distract us. And if I'm going to look unto Jesus, I've got to look away from all of this other stuff. And too often we get our eyes on the world, we get our eyes on the problem, and we forget the goal. Now we are not focused on the ultimate goal of my life. What's the goal of your life? If, if, if you had to sit down with a piece of paper and put it in words, the goal of my life is... Many people, if you would distill their answers, would come out with something like, the goal of my life is to be comfortable. Really. For most people, that's what it is. Now, they might say, well, I, I'd like to make a certain amount of money. Why? Well, so I'd be comfortable. You know, I want to be able to retire when I'm 60 or 50. <laughs> and I just want to have a comfortable life. We pray for health. Why? Well, I want to be comfortable. I don't like the pain. See, that's not really a worthy goal. We are not here to find ease and comfort. We are not here to have success. We are here to glorify God. We are here to fulfill His purpose. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, the Apostle Paul says, we make this our goal, to be pleasing to Him. That ought to be the goal of life. My goal in life is to please God. Whatever He wants me to do, it may be going through great difficulty. And the only question that we really have to answer in life is, how can I glorify God right now? in this situation. So I may be in a state of prosperity. I may have much. I may have good health. How can I glorify God using all that he has given to me right now? My possessions, my state of mind, my state of uh, being, whatever it is. How can I glorify God? I may be hurting horribly. How can I glorify God? in the midst of all of my suffering. Oftentimes, we pray for healing. That's legitimate. But why? Why do you pray to be healed? So you can be comfortable? Well, I don't know if that's really a worthy motive for praying for healing, just so you'll feel better. What if your motive was, Father, I'm asking that you heal me of this, whatever it is, so I can give you the glory for what you have done in my life. I will praise you. I will go out. I will tell people I was ill. I was stricken with cancer. I was injured. Something happened to me, and look at what God has done. Go out and give that testimony. You be the witness. Look what God did. God delivered me from this horrible situation. Now your prayer, you see, has a, an entirely different goal. It's not so you can be comfortable. It's so that you can glorify the Lord in all of the grace and mercy that he shows to you. And if God doesn't heal you, you can glorify him in that situation. One of the greatest testimonies I ever heard a man by the name of Sternberg. He was the leading oncologist in the state of Arkansas. An atheistic Jew who came to faith in Jesus Christ. He gave this testimony. It was marvelous. He said, now in my business, I don't have many survivors. Most of my patients die. He said, I'll tell you how I became a Christian. That I watched Christians die, and Christians don't die like other people. Wow! I thought about that. That just overwhelmed me. Christians don't die like other people. He said, I saw people dying, and they were bitter, they were angry, and families were feuding, and it was just, you know, it's just terrible. 
He said, but I'd walk into the room of a Christian and they are in incredible pain and they are on their way out. They're dying. They know they don't have very long to live. And I walk in the room and they say, hey, doc, I know where I'm going. What about you? One day you're going to be in my situation. You're going to be facing death. Where are you going to go? What's going to happen to you? And he said, I saw Christians dying, and they weren't bitter. They weren't angry. They weren't cursing God. Instead, they're blessing God. And just this testimony of Christians in horrible conditions praising God. You see, if my focus is on Jesus, if my focus is, is on fulfilling God's purpose, on praising God. That changes everything. He's saying we need to look away from all of the stuff and all of the circumstances, and we need to be looking away toward Jesus. He's the goal. I need to keep my eye on where I am going. Where am I going? To be absent from the body is to be present face to face with the Lord. That's where I'm going. So I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I need to be looking away unto Jesus. He is the goal. Now he is called here the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now the word author, it doesn't mean somebody who writes a book in this context. Literally, the word means one who shows the way. Jesus is called the one who shows the way back in Hebrews 2.10. He is the one who shows us the way with regard to faith. Did he have faith? Did he believe God? Yes. He knew the word of God. He knew the plan of God. And he believed that the Father was going to fulfill that that plan that was being carried out through the cross. So here he is called the author, or the one who shows the way. And he is also called the perfecter of our faith. Apparently this word perfecter was coined by the writer of Hebrews because it's not found anywhere else. It's the only place in the world you can find this Greek word. Uh, It's based on the word uh, that means perfect or the word that's used for maturity. So in Hebrews 6.1 where he says, let us go on to perfection or let us go on to maturity, Jesus here is called the perfecter or the one who brings to maturity. I need to have a focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think too often we get caught up in in a lot of details and, and really we forget about Jesus. That's why we have one reason we have communion in remembrance of him. Do I really need a memorial? We we have monuments. We have memorials. Why do we have them so we don't forget? Do I really need some kind of memorial to remind me of Jesus? Well, apparently so. Because we can get so caught up with studying who knows what that we forget about Jesus. But we need to have him in mind day by day. He is the one who showed the way. He's the one that brings our faith to maturity. And now we have this expression that says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him. 
What was it that sustained the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to the cross? What was his motivation? What was his goal? What was he thinking? It says here, for the joy that was set before him. What is that joy that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ? It was you. You were the joy set before the Lord Jesus Christ. When he went to the cross, he had you personally in mind. And he is seeing that he is going to bring many sons into glory. He is going to be in the midst of his brethren. And it gave him joy to contemplate the fellowship that we would have with him for all eternity. That was the joy that was set before him. He went to the cross. The physical suffering, very intense. But even worse than that was the, in, the incredible, infinite suffering of bearing the sins of the world, of bearing my sins. And some people get the idea, well, when, when it came time to bear my sins, Jesus had a little breather on the cross, you know, like mine aren't so bad. No. It was infinite suffering for your sins. But in spite of all of the humiliation, the shame, and the suffering of the cross, Jesus had something that provided joy for him, and it was that prospect that one day we would have eternal fellowship. We need to keep focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in his case, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The word endured, we've already seen this word in this context in the previous verse. In verse 1, he says, let us run with endurance. Now, we come to verse 2. He endured. We need to run with endurance. Don't give up under the pressure. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he didn't give up. He endured. Despising the shame, the cross only brought shame, the most shameful of deaths, the death of the cross. Not only shame from the crucifixion, incredible humiliation to be crucified, hung on a cross, naked, to be mocked. <laughs> well, he saved others, he couldn't save himself. Well, if you're really the Messiah, just, just step down from the cross. He despised that. But even more, the sins of the world being put upon him. For him, it was worth it. All of that shame, all of that humiliation. And he submitted to his Father's will. And now, it says he sat down, perfect tense, sat down in the past with the result that he is still there and he will remain there until, as it says in Psalm 110, 1, sit down on my right-hand side until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, the position of exaltation, the position of glory, the position of honor. He finished the race, his race. We need to keep looking at the goal, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verse 3, what are we going to do with this information? So what? What am I to do with this? Verse 3, consider. The word consider, it's a, a command, an imperative. The word means to reckon, to compare, to weigh something. 
For us, it means understanding who and what Jesus Christ is, what he has done. Here's the key to the whole problem. Here's the cure for doubt. Here's the cure for hesitation. Here's the cure for fear. We need to be thinking, thinking, thinking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider the one who endured. Now again, we have the same verb that was used in verse 2. He didn't give up under the pressure. He endured such contradiction of sinners or hostility from sinners against himself. There are those who mock the Lord Jesus Christ, those who think his death was not significant, was not meaningful, but he endured it. Now he says we need to do this, we need to consider, we need to be thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he endured on the cross. And he endured that for me. He endured that for you. And he said you need to do this lest you grow weary and faint in your souls. You ever get tired? Hey, I'm tired of all this. I don't need this. We do. Sometimes we just get weary. I'm tired of the struggle. <laughs> I said something to your pastor many years ago. First time I said it, he really became a little bit irritated with me. No, he became angry with me, okay? <laughs> Something happened. And I said, Robbie, you need to learn to love the battle. <laughs> That's hard to do. But the point is, we have things that happen to us, and we don't like it. And we, we all understand that. We get angry. But you have to understand what it's all about. And it's not all about you. We're in this conflict. We're in this battle. And we have to recognize it for what it is. It's just an opportunity to glorify the Lord right now. Am I going to trust God? Am I going to obey God? Am I going to glorify God in this situation? Oh, you may be Going down the freeway, someone cuts you off. <laughs> Get out of fellowship pretty quick, do you? Well, it's just a little test. It may be that something really bad will happen to you. I don't know. We talked about a hurricane and, you know, people losing their homes. Five feet of water in your house. Well, that's a different kind of a test. What are you going to do? I was talking to a man recently, and he was really complaining about his situation. And I said, do you think that God knows about your situation? Well, probably does, yeah. Hey, is God uh, omniscient? Yes, God knows all things. So God knows about your situation, yes. Uh, do you believe that God is omnipotent? Yes. So that means God could solve your problem. God has the resources. He could solve your problem. Do you believe that? He said, yes. I said, but he didn't do that, did he? God knows where you are, and he has the ability to solve your problem, but he didn't do it, did he? No. Why do you think that is? Why do you think God didn't solve your problem? Because he wants you to glorify him in spite of your circumstances. He wants you to glorify him in the midst of those circumstances. Now you have an intensified opportunity to glorify God. 
God can deliver you out of any circumstance. If he does not choose to do so, he's got a better plan. You say, well, how could it be better? Look at how I'm suffering. <laughs> do you believe that God can take all things, make them work together for good? I mean, do you believe Genesis 50, 20? That's the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8, 28, where Joseph said, well, you meant it unto me for evil, but God meant it for good. Are you going to do that, or are you going to grow weary and faint in your souls? The word faint... To be enfeebled, <laughs> to get tired. That is not an option for Christians as far as fulfilling the plan of God is concerned. We are here not for comfort and ease. We are not here for success as the world defines success. We are here for one purpose. That's God's purpose. And we are here to glorify Him. That in all things Christ might have the preeminence. That's why we're here. So where is the focus? What's your goal? Where are you going in life? There's a verse... I try to remind myself every day when I start the day. It's Colossians 1.10. If you don't know it, go ahead and memorize it. <laughs> I encourage people to memorize Scripture. Are you doing that? You memorize Scripture? You still do that? I think you ought to. At least a verse a week. Colossians 1.10, the Apostle Paul is praying, and he's praying for the Colossians, and, and he says, I pray that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Your walk, that's your daily conduct. How do you live? Walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. That's the first thing, where there are four things in the verse. Second thing, to please Him in all respects. That's every area of your life, your thought life, your speech life, your overt actions. In every area of life, we need to seek to please Him. Is my attitude pleasing to the Lord? Is my speech pleasing to the Lord? Or am I simply trying to satisfy my own desires? Thirdly, he says, to bear fruit in every good work. What he's saying here, don't waste your life. We need to redeem the time. So that what you are doing in any area of life needs to be done in such a way that God is glorified. And if God is being pleased with what you do, then your life has meaning and significance. As I get older and, and talk to older people, and people say, well, what did I ever do in life? What's it all about? They're, they're worried about their life hasn't really meant anything. It hasn't accomplished anything. There's only one way to have true significance in life. Otherwise, you're going to come to the end of your life, you're going to look back over your shoulder, and you're going to say, so what? But what makes your life truly significant is what you have done for the Lord. If you have pleased God, if you have obeyed God, then you have changed eternity, and your life is significant. You can read Hebrews chapter 11. You know, some of those people in there, they really didn't have much in life. They didn't do much in life, really. I mean, like Samson. This guy was just a thug. I mean, he really didn't do much in his life that was pleasing to God, but at one point, he trusted God. 
He gave testimony of his faith in God when he trusted him, and he pulled down the pillars of that temple. Was his life significant? Well, it was. I mean, he's written up in the Bible. That's not going to happen for me. <laughs> but it happened for him. You see, you can do something you may think it's insignificant. God says, it'll last forever. Now, that's significant. Your life does mean something. So if you can say, today, I have done the will of God, at least once. If you can say, I did something that was pleasing to the Lord, ah, your life counts. It does mean something. And we need to have that as a daily focus to bear fruit in every good work. And then fourthly, he says, and to increase in the knowledge of God. I need to do that. I don't know enough doctrine. I don't know enough Bible. I need to keep on keeping on. What are we going to do? We, we've got this Word of God. But the goal is not simply to learn the Word of God. The, the goal is to learn the Word of God so that I can do something with it. So that I can use it to fulfill the purpose for which God leaves me alive in this world. That I can use this Word in order to run the race set before me that I can do it with endurance, not giving up, and keeping my eye on the goal. It's not just a matter of endurance. I grit my teeth. I'm going to get through this. No, I'm going to keep my eye on the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who has given me the example. He's the one that kept his eye on the goal. And so he was able to endure the cross and despised the shame because he had that goal in mind. And because he finished his race, wherefore also God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You have a purpose in life. Glorify the Lord looking unto Jesus, lest you grow weary and faint in your souls. Let's pray. I give thanks, Father, for your word that we have to point out areas of weakness, to show us how to correct deficiencies, to show us how we can live in a way that will fulfill your purpose it will bring you glory. I thank you that you have provided everything necessary for us to have victory in the race. We have all things necessary to fulfill your purpose. I pray that we might learn these provisions, that we would utilize these provisions through the power of the Holy Spirit so that our lives will have significance but most of all, so that we might fulfill your purpose, bring you glory, and give preeminence to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us, who gave himself for us. May we give testimony. May we be witnesses of all of your grace, your mercy, the marvelous blessings that you have poured out upon us. And may we show our gratitude by living faithful lives. I thank you for this time we've had in your word. I pray that uh, your spirit will bring these things into our minds. May the words of Scripture ring in our ears to motivate us to look unto Jesus. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.